And hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Friday. Um, I am Kate Wakelin from Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia, and I'm here for our weekly Facebook Friday live broadcast. So thank you to everybody. I know lots of people in our private discussion group on Facebook put this in their diaries and they make a date with me every week, which I feel is really special. You'll see that I've got um, a guest with me today, and I'm going to introduce Desiree um, a little bit more fully in a moment. But before I go any further, I'll just let you know the date so that I can look back on this video and know where I I am. It's the 12th of December um, and I'm saying that with a big breath because that's come up really fast for me. I don't know about you but before I anyway before I keep going I'd like to just um, acknowledge that I am broadcasting to you from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and just always want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. One of the things I know lots of you know about me is that I love to go running along the Yarra River which in the Birrurung language, uh, sorry beg your pardon, in the Woiwurrung language is called the Birrurung. Uh, last weekend I was, um, I felt very grateful to be able to run all the way into pretty much into the city um, along that wonderful river doing a half marathon for neuroendocrine cancer Australia so um, I've got a couple of black toenails but um, but it was such a beautiful run along the way and I carried um, so many of you along with me as we uh, ran with um, one of our neuroendocrine cancer volunteers Catherine who's also my running buddy um, and we're able to take in great big lungfuls of fresh river air and um, really enjoy the the the, um, the scenery and the, the wild terrain along there so um, I'm very grateful for out where I am uh, but I would like to introduce you to Desiree. So um, Desiree is someone who has been part of our community for a long time. Um, and I chatted with Desiree ages ago um, about her experience of living with the impact of NET in their family. And I'll let Desiree tell her story um, and you know introduce that story to us. But uh, when we when we chatted a few months ago, I was just so taken by uh hearing the, the things that they've done as a family to really position themselves with neuroendocrine cancer. And I was um, so keen to allow other people into hearing that story and, and hearing some of the things that they've thought about and some of the things they've considered along the way, because I feel like there's going to be a lot of um, common ground with our net community. So Desiree, welcome. It's so great to have you along. Thank you for having me. Um, and I am just making sure it's all working on my end and I can see that people have joined us, which is really fantastic. So thank you everyone for, for watching along. Um, Desiree, tell us how you've become associated with Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia. Paul, 10 and a half years ago, Paul um, ended up with kidney stones. So, and Paul is your... Paul is Paul Stevenson, uh, my husband. Uh, he is actually the finance director now for the um, Neuroendocrine Cancer Foundation and has been for, I don't know, two-thirds of my life. Um, I think seven or eight or nine years, it's been, it's been a while um, and part of the family um, pretty much. Um, yeah, so he ended up with kidney stones um, and in a fetal position in the middle of the lounge room floor in the middle of the night. We ended up going down to the Monash Hospital um, and into emergency. And seven or eight hours later, they did an X-ray and found the kidney stones. But the young, um, there was a young resident there, and he noticed a shadow um, just out to the side uh, and suggested that we go and do a little bit more investigation. Turned out that that was um, a tumour. It was around about the size of a golf ball. Um, three days later, we were in Cabrini um, and he was having it removed together with a third of his large intestine. Um, they then, we got assigned to um, a doctor who was not a... Um, a NETS specialist. Um, the, I think the biggest thing for me, like, was when Paul Cashin, who was the surgeon that removed the tumour, he actually rang me as I was walking in my front door and told me that we were lucky um, because 
Paul hadn't had any symptoms till then. I mean, whether that's lucky or not, I, I don't know. Um, so he's obviously, it's slow growing, obviously. So he's had it for a long time. Um, and he told me that they had done the biopsy on it, that it was net. So you know how you remember the one thing and that one thing was me shutting the door, sitting on the floor and just bursting into tears because it's the first um, confirmation that Paul had cancer. Um, so that was pretty horrible. Um, we, How old were you that when that all... Uh, sorry, I'm asking you a very personal question. But... Um, okay, so that's 10 years ago. So um, 48. Uh, Paul's 40, uh, 47. We have one son. He was 15. Um, so that's a... It's a sort of a weird one. You sort of sit there and you go, okay, where do we go from here? Um, the particular doctor was great we ended up going to this we got assigned to this um this doctor and the plan was because they did then they did full scans the plan was most of it was in the liver um and there was one that was near the heart so they did uh keyhole surgery to remove the one by the heart um, which went really well um, Paul was out of hospital in three days in Paul's normal fashion and, and off um, recovering. Um, and so the date was set for Paul to go into hospital and have um, the surgery on his liver. And basically they were going to remove half of his liver. Um, and that all fell apart and um, they had made the decision that it was actually life-threatening for Paul to have that operation. So we took a step back from that. Um, the particular um, doctor that we had been assigned to was actually the same doctor that Kristen had. Um, and he was dreadful, <laughs> to say the least. We're not going to mention any names here. No, but... we won't mention any names. He was, he was dreadful. We came to, we had quite a terse conversation on the phone when he wouldn't return my phone call. Um, and eventually he then um, referred us to Peter Mack and in the same meeting, which was the last time we saw him, um, gave us information on the Unicorn Foundation. And so the Unicorn Foundation um, became part of our life very, very early on. So we're talking maybe six or seven weeks after we found out um, the Unicorn Foundation, that was where we started. Um, we're both control freaks um, without a word of a lie and not knowing is the thing that we found the hardest, not being in control. You had no, I mean, he was of no use. So, you know, Google is our friend um, straight onto the Unicorn Foundation. And then we got... Uh, to go to our first meeting at um, Peter Mac. Uh, and we sat um, in front of a whiteboard for an hour and a half and they explained the whole thing. And it was at that point that I think we breathed for the first time. And it was just having a little, knowing that there was someone standing in front of us that had a clue what was going on and from then we just started to build and it's a matter then of working out how it worked for us what did we have to do as a family to 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 move forward because surgery was out of the question base and that was because um, there were too many bits and pieces there was too many tumors right the way through his liver and and, and I, the right decision was made, um, but it took surgery off the table. So then when surgery goes off the table, you go, what do you do now? Um, and so began the journey, if you want to put it that way. So that's the, that was the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm, you've mentioned the name of another person, Kristen. So um, I know lots of people won't know Kristen's story. So I'll make sure I put the video. We've actually got a... Um, a video of Kristen sharing her story at one of our um, patient forums a little while ago. So I'll make sure I put that in the notes. But 
I guess what, on reflection, at least he did tell you about Unicorn Foundation, which would have been oh, a yeah. case. That's interesting that he, there were lots of things that weren't ideal, but then still he managed to link you in with the... But the funniest thing was he actually turned around and, and, and offered to be our advocate. And I just looked at him and I went, I don't think so. Yeah. Really? He had been useless. Um, and... Just know, thanks very much. I'll find someone who actually um, is going to be of use and, and I, we can be our own advocate. And I think that's key. Um, what you've just said is about being your own advocate. Is, that's a, that's a, like a, if there was a golden thread that ran through the conversations that I have with people affected by NETS, whether it's patients or carers, it, it, it so often distills into this being really, really key, really important is this sense of you need to actually learn to take control of your own situation because sometimes you can't necessarily um, count on people all knowing all the things that they need to know to help you. I, I think so. And I think every, um, every person who has NETS is different, every partner is different. Every relationship is different. So what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for somebody else. And it can be your family dynamic. It can be your close friends around you. Um, and it's that navigation from the, the first initial um, point where you learn. And then you've got all of these other hurdles. It's and a lot of the time, the bit that you need to get settled isn't actually the medical bit because the medical bit's going to happen. You know, once you're diagnosed, I mean, and let's be honest, that's half the problem is getting diagnosed. But once you get to that point, the medical bit, it's going to move forward um, and, and everyone is different. Everyone's symptoms are different. Everyone reacts to the treatments differently. So no one can say, well, you know, once you get on here, you're going to go one, two, three, four, five. You could be, could be going one, three, seven, two, eight, nine. Yet everyone's different. But for us, for our family, we made the decision that we had to get everything else around it settled. And there was a couple of things for us that were really important. One of them was stress. We saw quite early on that stress was the one thing that um, made Paul symptoms worse. Um, and he was reasonably lucky his symptoms are, uh, were then and are still pretty mild when I hear what some other people go through. Um, you wouldn't wish them on anybody, but they are not as bad as a lot of other people have experienced. Um, and so stress made it worse. So um, he was in a very high stress job. Uh, we changed that situation um, and he actually took six months off. He um, went through a redundancy uh, in the job that he was, took six months off. And in that six months, he worked for the Unicorn Foundation uh, on grants. Uh, and it was just a way that he was able to put back in um, everything that we had started getting out of it. And of course, then he got bored, so he needed to, to work. So he started working again. Um, so that was the first thing. So it was stress around work. Um, and of course, then there's stress around family. So um, Paul hates when he tells Nick to do something. Nick goes, yeah, I'll do it. And then he has to tell him again. So I sat Nick down at the age of 15 and I said, your dad's sick. And I said, and we all know he doesn't have a lot of patience. I said, he's got way less now, honey. So when your dad tells you to do something, you do it. You don't do it in five minutes. You don't do it in three minutes. You do it now. I was really lucky that Nick actually took that on board. I think maybe being 15, um, seeing Paul in hospital, it, it sort of rocked him a little bit um, and that changed Nick um, and Nick always does what Paul wants straight away 
So we're taking, we keep looking at all the different things that are causing him stress um, and just trying to work out the best way for us to address it um, and to eradicate it. Um, and then, of course, the last thing is like not our family, but the family and the friends that sort of um, surround you. Um, and everyone has those amazing friends that are just, they're it. And doesn't matter what you tell them, they are phenomenal. Then you've got friends who really don't know what to do with it. Um, and I was saying to Kate earlier, we actually lost um, some really close friends um, just basically because they just didn't know how to deal with the fact that Paul was sick and they didn't know where to put themselves. And that's a really hard thing to, at the time it was really hard to deal with, but you just have to, we felt that we just had to let that go um, and you can't worry about it. Yeah, everyone has to be comfortable in what they're doing. Um, and so like we're talking seriously close friends mm -hmm. um, and we don't see them anymore. Um, but, you know, other people fill the, fill the gap and you meet new people. People always come and go out of your life for whatever reason. Um, and then the last bit is immediate family. Um, and my parents were, my parents are in New Zealand, um, so... We, you know, I just rang them up and I said, look, this is the way it is. This is how we've decided we're going to handle it. You have to get on board. And they were right. Let's just do that. With Paul's parents, it was a little harder. They wanted to ring him every day and talk about it every day. And we had decided as a family, we didn't want to do that. Um, so we actually, they came down to visit and I actually had to sit them down and I think the conversation went a little along the lines of, I know that you are Paul's parents, but we can't deal with it this way. We don't want to talk about it every day. This is not something that defines us as a family. When something changes, we will talk about it then. Um, and it's and John's comment, who is Paul's dad, and we've actually lost him to cancer since then. Four years ago, we lost John. His comment was, well, Judy's very upset about this. And I said, well, I understand that. She's his, she's his mother. I, I totally get that. And I went, but you know what? It's not about Judy and it's not about you. Sadly, it's not about me because it's usually about me and it's not about Nick. It's actually about Paul. And this is what Paul wants. You guys have got to get on board because this is going to be a part of our life for a very long time and we have to find a way that is sustainable for us. And not everyone's like that, but this is what we had decided we needed to do to be able to um, deal with nets on a daily basis but not let it define our family. And we were lucky enough that they, act, you know, it was a little bit tense there for a bit, um, but eventually they got on board. Um, and um, it was really interesting because when Paul's dad actually got sick, um, he actually ended up with cancer. Um, it was, it came full circle. And for the first time I saw Paul and John have a conversation about this. And John said, I finally understand. Like, really understand. Yes, they said they, you know, they got on board and they did it the way we needed it to be done. But he then understood. And I think that's the most important thing is that everyone has to realise it's our way isn't the best. It's not the only way because every family is different and every person is different and how they want to deal with it. But it really does come down to one thing. I don't have nets. They don't have nets. The person who has nets was Paul. So the decision on how our family dealt with it, how it worked, was the, what worked 
best for him, what made him most comfortable and what made him less stressed about what was going on. And I think that formed the basis of the next 10 years. We deal with everything exactly that way. It's interesting hearing you talk, Desiree, because you we started the story by talking about how you very quickly learned that you needed to advocate for yourselves in the medical system. But what I'm also hearing is that you very quickly learned that you needed to advocate and you in terms of being Paul's wife played a really active role in advocating for his needs with family and friends in the broader networks um, and getting them on board with how Paul needed to run this. Yeah, it's really important and that's how Paul wanted it. Um, can I tell you, a st- I've got a story. Um, Please tell us. I like talking. Can you tell? I'm really sorry. Um, I We have a very dear friend. We have known him for 16, 17 years. He was Nick's hockey coach when Nick was nine or 10. Um, and he we met him uh, through um, our son and their kids played hockey. Um, and Walter was Nick's coach, Um, and his partner, Deborah, um, was outstanding. We would sit and watch the kids, and we would talk about anything. She was such a a lot of fun. She was very, very strongly family-orientated, and we were really close friends. I got a phone call, and this is before Paul Paul was um, diagnosed, and I got a phone call from Walter, one morning and he was in tears and he said I have to tell you that Deborah's passed away and I went what Deborah had had breast cancer for five years and it had been her decision that she wanted no one to know other than Walter there's reasons behind that Um, her mother had had breast cancer and had fought 20 years for it the family knew um, and Deborah's decision was that she never wanted to put her family through what her and her sisters and her father had gone through um, ever. She wanted to not have her dad go through a second person in his family having breast cancer and that was her decision and it almost broke Walter. Walter told nobody. They told their two boys that Deborah had it two days before she passed. Oh, gosh. So this is, and I think this, my my point here is Walter, as Deborah's advocate, as her partner, did what Deborah needed to do to get through what she was going through. Um, and me, six months down the track, I'm still not getting it. I don't understand. Walter rang Deborah's father and, of course, is terrified that he's going to hate him for not telling, and his fa- her father broke down in, t- in tears and goes, thank you so much for not telling me that would have killed me. I could not have gone through that again. So what Deborah felt and how she saw it in relation to her family and what they had gone through um, is actually borne out by when uh, Walter actually rang her dad and, and, and told, her, told him what had happened. Um, that's what she needed and, and that's what Walter did. And I think my point here is that everyone's individual, everyone's different, everyone's situation is different, but it really comes back to one person and that's the person who is sick. And what that person needs um, is what as carers, advocates, partners, this is what we have to, we have to work it out, what it is, and then make it happen. And Walter, the day that I found out that Paul had nets, um, when Paul Cashin rang me, I made three phone calls. 
I rang my parents. Actually, I made, I rang a couple of sisters as well. I rang Paul's parents. I rang my parents. And I rang Walter. And I said, Walter, what do I do? Mm. And it's the only piece of advice that I've ever taken that doesn't come from a nurse or a doctor. And he said, Desiree, surprisingly enough, this is not going to be about you. This is going to be about Walter. Now, I don't mean to be rude, but I've got a T-shirt that actually says it's all about me. I had to put that T-shirt in the bottom drawer for a while. And he's right. It's actually, and, and because he had gone through what he had gone, I went, I took a step back and I went, he's actually right. And that's what drives me as a person, me as Paul's wife, is to, to realise that it, it has to be about him because he's the one who has needs. I don't have it. So I love what you're saying and I love what I'm hearing. What sustains you? I know what drives you. I can see, I can hear so clearly why this is so important and why this is there's this absolute correct belief that this has all got to be around what helps Paul. But you've been doing this a long time, Desiree, and I know there's clearly been challenges along the way. I'm sure this hasn't been a picnic the whole way along. No, can't say that it's been all that way. Look, you know what? Tell me there about that. Been, there, have been, there have been times when, you know, you know what, getting in the shower and having a good cry is great because no one can see. So I'll do that on a regular basis. Um, but I can remember a, a conversation that I had with my parents and I say, Mum, do you see me sitting in a corner and rocking? I'm not doing it because if I do that, I miss a day. For me, the glass has to be three quarters full and you have to be thankful. I personally am thankful for every day that I get, 10 and a half years and counting, thanks very much. It was Paul's birthday yesterday. He made the best dessert, right? But it's, the, it's those things. It's, it's seeing him, he and Nick went and played golf on, on Wednesday. It, those, are the, it, those are the things that make it really cool. And there's, we, it's brought us as a family, we're really close. We made the decision that it wasn't going to rule our life. Um, he doesn't have, um, look, he's, he's been through three lots of PRRT. Um, he's just coming out the end of the last one. This was pretty tough. Um, he had some, um, some really quite bad days. Um, but once again, I think on the, on the scale, I think there are a lot of people who have got a whole lot worse symptoms than Paul has on an ongoing basis. So when the days are really crap, then you look to find something that you can laugh about. Or um, for, for Paul, it's always about our life revolves around food. It always has, always will. The worst thing is when Paul's going through these, he can't drink wine. So I have to drink it for him. So that's my, <laughs> I, I'm assisting um, this is an important job that has well, to be it, done. Well, it's, you know, someone has to do it, right? <laughs> so I volunteered. Um, so on the bad days, you, you look to get through it. On the good days, you go, this is awesome. My, my, my everyday question to him is, how's your belly? Because that governs if Paul's stomach is not playing um, its part. He's lost a, a third of his large intestine. Needless to say, there are family jokes that we won't share outside the house. But, you know, those are the things, you know, it's really, it's horrible, but you turn it around and you go, okay, so that's the family joke. We laugh about that. So we've got the, the bad days, but then you've got the good days. You've got the things to, to look forward to. And it's 10 and a half years, people. So that's a good thing, right? Mm. And I'm looking to the next 10 and a half. And we've got amazing friends. Um, through NETS, we've met 
amazing people. Um, and knowledge is the key. The more you can find out, the more you can know. Um, the words are all too long for me. But Paul can sit down and have a conversation with a doctor and, and I go, which one of you is the doctor? And it's obviously, it, that's it, right? Um, and I think too, there was no point in me trying to learn that stuff because it just, my brain doesn't work that way. So I just do the other stuff. Um, so Paul looks after all of the, um, the medical stuff. Um, there are conversations um, where we would, we don't talk about it on a daily basis, but if he's going in for an X-ray, I can, you can tell that it's coming closer. You can just tell by his demeanor. So we look to deal with that. Um, if he's short, um, then you look to make sure that everything is just calm. Um, and if that means me getting on the phone to Nick and going, hey, don't do this, then you do that. And then he'll come out the other end three days later and it'll be fine and everything will be, you know, back on an even keel. But you do. It's, it's like you, you watch the waves um, and you work out the best way to calm the waters a little bit. But on the whole, he's pretty good. Desiree, I was going to ask you, I, I, I want to hear about this, but I've got a question to give you first, because I know when we were talking earlier, you were mentioning to me that you don't see yourself as a carer. So I want to ask you about that in a second. But before I get to talking about whether carer is the right word, I wanted to ask you what things people assume about um being a carer or things that people might not know about being a carer or maybe talk about the words that you would prefer to use instead of that word carer doesn't I don't think carer fits me um advocate most of all fits me. so sorry we're, we're losing a little bit of audio so just right. again. um carer doesn't fit me advocate is a closer word um Paul will tell you can I swear I think so. Swearing alert. Main <laughs> bitch. <laughs> if someone's getting in, in Paul's way, um, if you put the two of us side by side, Paul's actually got much of less um, patience than I do. But when it comes to this, if someone is doing the wrong thing or if something needs to be said, I'm going to be the one that's going to stand up and say it They're just straight down the line because that's, that's where I see that that's my role. My role is to make sure that it is as easy for Paul as possible. And if Paul's going to go and have a disagreement with somebody that's going to raise his stress level so have a seat honey let me get you a cup of coffee um, and I'll go talk to this person um, and it's most probably not as um, abrasive as that um, but there have been a couple of times um, you know with Paul's parents it was done with the utmost love but Paul couldn't do it it was not something he could not turn around to his parents and say, you have to back up. He couldn't do it. It wasn't possible. That's my role. Um, so, and if um, there's been a couple of times when we've, I've gone with him to uh, meetings with uh, Michael Michael and um, I have asked the question and Paul sat there really quietly. Uh, he's the one with all the medical knowledge, but we've talked about something prior. And I have no filter when it comes to that. I'm, I, I've got no issue with asking like a really straight down the line question. And I'm a little bit like a terrier with a bone. Give me the answer I'm looking for. Don't placate me. I don't want to hear what you think I need to hear. I actually need to hear A, the truth, and B, the right thing. And if I've got options, tell me those options. Um, 
and um, don't just try and fob me off. And, and once again, this is a personal thing. We actually need to, as a family, we need to know everything. Um, and we are capable of taking all that information on it. And not me, but Paul will go away <laughs> and work it all out. Um, but don't just give us the, you know, pat on the head and, and you know, sit down and, and we'll do it all for you. That doesn't work for us. Um, but once again, every situation is different and everyone needs to be handled differently. And I think the important thing is that as um, a carer, advocate, partner, whatever you want to, however you feel you need to label yourself, if you, if you need a label, uh, most of the time I don't bother, um, you have to work out how it best benefits, what best benefits you as a family. Because you are a family um, um, and you're with that person all the time. Um, but you have to work out what works for you. And for us, it's me standing up and saying, hey, no, that doesn't cut it. You need to give me a little bit more information. Or why haven't you done this? Why are you going down this path? We sat and we read this. Tell me why we're not doing that. And this, this came up. Um, we went to um, a we went to a meeting and one of the doctors got up and they were talking about having surgery versus not having surgery. And we had been told not to have surgery. But there was one particular tumour that was sitting there and Paul and I had gone out of, come out of a couple of the meeting with, meetings with Michael and he, we had both said to each other, how come we're not taking this one out? Don't we think that that would be a good idea? Because it's really not shrinking. It was after the first lot of PRT. We had a couple of those and we went back in and, and I went, right, I'm asking the question. And it was point blank. Why aren't you taking this tumour out? Don't just gloss over the fact. Tell me why you're not doing it. I want to know. And we didn't end up having the surgery. But for me, that's my role. When so got enough of an explanation that it... Yeah. yeah. And then we're, we're okay. Let's just move on. <laughs> we're all good. But it's about being proactive and and making yeah them. and and not everyone can do that like once again you've got everyone's different and maybe the person who maybe your partner actually needs to be the one to do that and they don't need you to do that maybe they they have they have to feel like they're completely in control and you just have to sit there and go and support them with that and, and I can't tell you which is the right one to do. You have to evaluate that for your own family. This is how our family works. Yeah. So um, if I'm hearing you clearly, it's 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 clear that there are more than one, that, that, that everyone's going to have their own way of managing this as a family. But what I'm hearing clearly from you, Desiree, is that you, you've done a lot of work in working out what's going to work for your family and then you set about to do it. And we've modified it along the way too. Um, so it, what, do you, what do you know now that you would have told uh, back then? What would I have told? What would I have told me back then? To listen to Walter. So that's the first thing I would have told me. Um, and I think uh, along the way um, there have been times when... Um, I have been disappointed, hurt um, when yeah, when someone you would you would see a reaction from someone, or you would see someone would say something, they would perceive something. Um, I would tell me not to worry about that quite so much, because it really doesn't matter what 
other how other people perceive how we deal with it um the right right here right now if someone doesn't like the way we're doing something or how we're handling it um well i'm really sorry but that's just the way it is um for us um everyone knows that if they have a question they can ask it you, you can ask you know I've got friends who know that um, Paul's next scans are coming up. If I don't ring them and tell them what happened in scans, I'm in trouble. We've always, our decision right at the very beginning was anyone who wanted to know what, where, what, where Paul was at a point in time, then we would tell them how he was how feeling. You, how um, do you manage that information, Desiree? Because I know that's tricky for a lot of families when there's a lot of... Yeah, it sort of it sort of is, and I think... It, we got there because I had such a big issue reconciling with the fact that I didn't know Deb was sick. Yeah. And once again, that's a personal thing that only, you know, the people, it's very unusual for someone to not tell anybody that they are sick and for us to learn after she's passed. So that drove how Paul and I perceived we wanted to deal with it. Um, and that made it really easy, actually. Um, we, don't go, we don't go graphic, like into graphic detail. Um, the last time that Paul went through the PRT, I had a percentage and I would say, um, they would say, oh, you know, how did he go? And I'd say, right, we've got, this is the percentage of reduction in the tumours. Um, and my sister uh, rings from, lives in Brisbane, and she will ring and go, her comment is, how's his guts? She's a true Queenslander. Um, and we have found that different people will ask at different times. Um, no one that knows me doesn't know that Paul has nets. We are not shy in saying it's not something that we feel we have to keep quiet. I would talk about it more than Paul does. Um, there are people that work with Paul, I think, that still don't know because he, he sort of you can't sort of see it in him. Um, and But if someone asks a question, I'm going to answer them straight down the line because that works for us and like I said I, I think it's 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 driven and it, it was bred it born from how hard I found not knowing that that Deb was sick yeah um, it sounds like that really set you up for some yeah I, I surprisingly enough I think it if if I look back at a lot of the decisions that we've made along the journey I can actually take a lot of them and the, the root of where that we thought we needed to start or, or the germ of the idea of how we were going to do something, a lot of it actually comes back to that. And it, and it does, it's all about how you perceive things and, and what affects you and, and, and your journey to even get to the start. It, you know, what has made you be the person you are when you find out mm. that your partner has nets? Mm. And cancer is a really crap thing. And, you know, sadly, I know way more people now that have got it, have had it, than I did when I was 30. Um, maybe that's because I'm getting old. But that's the thing. I know more people and, and people deal with it differently. And I think, you know what, the one thing that I hate hearing, there's one thing I hate. You handle that so well, Desiree. Okay. Note to anyone watching. <laughs> I was going to ask you, Desiree, I, you mentioned earlier in the conversation around some uh, sadly losing some friendships what would be your advice to people if they're in the position, maybe they're watching this video because they know someone who's been diagnosed with NETS and they don't know what to say or they don't know what to say to the family. What are you it, You know what? It's really hard. Yeah. Um, what could people have, what did people, but the people who were, who were helpful, what did they do? Um, 
You know what? I think it was, I had like our really close friends actually said that the first question was, what do you need from us? And I've got to say, that is the easiest opening for anybody who's sitting on this side of it. That was so easy because I could say to them, you know what, this is what we've decided. We don't want to talk about it every day. I promise that if something happens that's, you know, um, significant, we will let you know. And we've, we've lived up to that promise. Um, if there is significant changes, I do get on the phone to... Uh, Paul's mum, um, his sister, my family, our really close friends. Um, I, I actually do. I pick up the phone and go, hey, Paul's going in for this or, or you know, he's doing really well or whatever. So, but that, I found that really easy. When people don't know what to say, it's a little harder. Um, and so from having to drive it from this side and there were somewhere where they had no clue it was ringing up and going you know what Paul's got this this is how we want to work it as a family you know we want to be open but we don't want it to define our lives we would love it if you would do this um, and I think and those were the two things that I think I learned that a little bit better later on. <laughs> I don't think I was quite so good the, the, at the beginning um, with that bit. Um, but I'm better at that now um, because in the big scheme of things, you know, you have to, it's, it's not going away. It's, it's staying here, <laughs> which is really shit. Um, it's not going anywhere um, but we've worked out the best thing that the things that work for our family and we just keep building on that mm. um, and we have the most amazing family we have the most amazing friends because they've all we've been really lucky that they've actually allowed us to do what we think we need to do mm. um, and no one rings us up and say, oh, you should be doing this. They don't, they don't bother to do that. They'll ring up and say, what time's breakfast? You know, the really important things in <laughs> life. <laughs> so I, I think that's, uh, if you take anything, if anyone takes anything out of this, I think what you have to take out of it is that what I do may not be what you need to do, mm -hmm. but do what we did and work out what is the best thing. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, then it makes it a little bit your journey. You know, that's a really, I hate that word. Let's just pick another word. <laughs> it makes the <laughs> journeys a horrible word. They use that on all of those, you know, the, the, um, the bachelorette and all of those really. <laughs> The journey has been this. Well, it's not a journey. <laughs> the rose, Desiree. <laughs> I know, right? Um, it just it makes life um, uh, easier to, to, to deal with day to day because, you know what, the sun's still going to come up tomorrow. Mm. What happens when the sun comes up? You know, some of that's out of your control, but there's actually a lot of it that is within your control. Um, mm. And we... Like I said at the beginning, we're control freaks. So we try and control everything we can. So you um, worked out the really important things to control. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, oh. So, yeah. What a fantastic conversation. I'm hearing, you know, I've got so many key pearls from listening to you talk about your experiences and I'm so grateful for you sharing those things. I'm hearing you know, really early on that the glass was three quarters full. Um, I heard you talk about feeling lucky, which is interesting because I also heard you talk very honestly about it being shit. Um, and yep. I think I think it's the, the fact that you can entertain both in the same brain simultaneously. And on the same day, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think that's really key. And that's what I that's what I love when I talk with you, Desiree, because I feel like you don't shy away from the shit stuff 
but you still have this sense of, okay, how am we going to position ourselves? Where, how are we going to run this bit, given that there's, there's shit things? But, gosh, food is really important, and if he can't drink the wine, then maybe I can have more. Or oh, someone, by the way. <laughs> there is always a silver lining when it comes to wine, Kate. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> so someone's actually in the comments of the live Facebook group. Someone's actually offered to give you their quota as well, so you could be quite well supported. Oh, yay. I'm in. <laughs> But look, thank you so much. Is there anything before we before we wind up? Is there anything that you feel like we were going to talk about or that we should have talked about that you would really love to mention? You know what? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, oh, I just lost you. Say it again. I, I don't think so. All it, what I want people the, the reason I did this, Kate, was to to maybe if just one person takes away one tiny little thing that in three months time they can look back and they can go yeah that actually helped then that's awesome and if you don't get that and all you did was laugh at what I was saying well that's awesome too <laughs> you know but it, it this I'm, I'm just hoping that and everyone does things differently and and everyone like people that I've other people that I've spoken to um, and I have talked to to different people um, both who who have it um, and and whose partners have it not even just nets patients like my sister um, the one in Brisbane she went through breast cancer um, and we would get on the phone and she was actually going through it when like when Paul was going through. So we would get on the phone and start laughing at the nurses or whatever was, excuse me, whatever was going on. And just you would find the weirdest things to laugh about. And that's um, the thing, I think. I was going to say, you know, the, the, the glass is three quarters full, the feeling lucky and celebrating 10 years, but knowing that there's still plenty, there's been quite a lot yeah. of shit in there, but also the, the humour in all of that that you've been yeah, out. It is, there's just some yeah. really, really funny things that have happened along the way. And you look back and you go, you know what? That wouldn't have happened if Paul hadn't had net. So it's really, really rubbish that he's got it. But there are memories along the way of um, things that have happened because of the people that we have met. Like I sat there and listened to Paul speak at the Theon... The Theranos Theranostics. Is that how I say it? The words are horrible, these networks. Yeah, but, who knows what that is? But I sat there and listened to him speak and he was speaking to all these doctors and he stuck Snoopy up on the screen. My husband is a rabid Snoopy. Um, fan and he's talking to these doctors from all over the world and he stuck Snoopy up on the screen to explain something and I went that's my boy yeah and I look back on that and and his message to them was you know think about the patient we know that you deal with them but each person is different so that was his message to them but the fact that he put Snoopy up I go Oh my god, that's so cool! I was crying at the end, but I was laughing. I really the way got through. a video of that, so I might try and put that in the notes too. It was so funny. So I, I yeah, I remember. The other thing too is for everything that's really bad, celebrate the great things, and they could be something so simple as a great dinner, or going for a walk after and being able to get all the way around without visiting the, the toilet. I don't know, whatever it is, but there are all these things that you can celebrate along the way that are mundane, everyday things. But when you think back five years' time and three years' time ago, that was really cool. Yeah, That's what I want to take away. Thank you so much. I can, I can tell you already by looking at the comments that 
it's made a difference to more than one person, to, to plenty of people. And there, I, I just, the, the, there is one comment that I just have to read out to you, Desiree, before we finish up, which is the final comment in the little feed on the Facebook Live. And um, someone's just said, there's so many people out there who really need to watch this video. And so <laughs> Let's I- Let's not do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm so grateful to you for sharing some of your, um, I'm not going to use the word journey, but oh, thank God for that experiences with <laughs> us because I feel like you've you've done some hard slog over the last ten years learning these things about how to manage with nets as a family, and I'm I'm so grateful to you for sharing that with all of the people who are coming on through who'll be able to take those pearls of wisdom and and run with them. So we're so grateful. Thanks for thank you, me, Kate. It's been a joy. It's been wonderful. Okay, so I am, I'm, I'm just going to, I don't have very much more to talk about today. Often I have a, you know, half an hour of plugs to give, but it's getting towards December, the end of December, which is when um, we take a break, which is um, something I do want to just let people know about. So next week is my final full week in the office. So you will see me on Friday for a final pre-Christmas, pre-Hanukkah, Facebook Friday. And then um, the, the following week, uh, I'm in the office on the Monday, the 21st, and then the 22nd, which is the Tuesday, we've got our final Zoom open Facebook group meeting. So if you're in the private discussion group, you want to have a chance to connect with people in real time using webcams. Um, we'll We'll be doing that on Tuesday afternoon on the 22nd of December. So keep a lookout for that. And then our office at Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia will be closed for a couple of weeks. So if you need to talk with me before Christmas, um, there's a few days for you to do that. So um, I just to make sure that you know then that I'll be off from the 22nd of December until I think the 9th of January is my first day back in the office um, in 2021. Um, thank you so much, Desiree, once again for, for joining us today. I just... I'm so grateful you're so generous with your time and with your experiences and um, I know that everyone's going to take this and, and watch it again for the pearls of wisdom that you've shared so thank you to you and okay. and thank you to everyone who's joined us live online and I will look forward to seeing you all next week I'm just going to click the button to say goodbye <laughs>